Good morning, everyone. I'm going to sneak in an announcement before Kathy gives you her, her announcements and all her information. Just a quick reminder that the Friends of the North Grenville Public Library next Saturday afternoon are going to have an afternoon of thoughts, music, discussion, casual conversation, and an English tea refreshment. It's free. It's called the Pat Babin Inspirational. And it's at the library next Saturday from 2 to 4. So if you're looking for something to do Saturday afternoon, you know musicians, they'll talk for a little while, but I can imagine they'd rather strum for a little while. Thank you. Well, good morning again. <laughs> Welcome to all attending this very special confirmation service, both in person and virtually. We really look forward to wel welcoming Bree and Brooke into our membership at St. John's, and we thank Bev Buckingham for her leadership and guidance. And I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to Bree and Brooke's grandparents who are visiting from Grandview, Manitoba for this very special event. <laughs> One announcement about uh, next Sunday after church, please considering, consider joining the visioning committee for a visioning workshop, asset mapping workshop, right after the service next Sunday, lunch will be provided. Uh, Friendship Cafe lunches and the drawing circle continue, everybody's welcome. And the movie night is happening this Friday. Again, I can only imagine, for those of you who attended last Wednesday for Jesus Christ Superstar, it was a great show and enjoyed by all. A uh, note from Helen regarding the anniversary supper there are only six tickets left, so please get your tickets if you'd like to come, but that's good news. And finally, a note about the Grenville Concert Choir. The notes are in your bulletin about how to secure tickets for that. I'm very pleased to welcome back Bev Buckingham to our worship as our worship leader this morning. Welcome, Bev. Thanks, Kathy. Girls. <coughs> We take, the, we take time on this day to be aware of the land and creation around us. We acknowledge that for thousands of years, First Nation peoples have walked on this land. Their relationship with the land is at the center of their lives and spirituality. We gather on the traditional, unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe. We give thanks to the Algonquin, the first peoples of this land where we worship today. We honor the historic relationship of the Haudenosaunee and the Huron-Wendat people and acknowledge their stewardship of the land throughout the ages. Their, st their stewardship and spiritual connection to the land speaks to us today, connecting us to the land that we all share. It pronounces our awareness of the gifts that the land provides. We are all accountable for the care of this land now and for future generations. That's the call to worship. We come together as witnesses to your abundant love. We come away from the rest of our lives. And we ask you to be here with us as we witness your love made real through Jesus the Christ. Amen. Thank you, girls. I invite you to stand as you're able and 
Join in the singing of our first hymn, Voice in Voices United 567, Will You Come and Follow Me? This morning, our prayer of approach was written by Christine Jarrett of Edge, our new ministry development in Toronto, and used with permission. Let us pray. We pray to you, God of grace and of love in word and song. You surprise us in your resurrection power, at work in Jesus' life and death, bringing new beginnings and showing up in unexpected places. You surprise us in your resurrection power, at work in our lives and in our deaths, the places where we have given up and do not expect you to act in any way that matters. You surprise us in your resurrection power, calling us by name, giving us one another, siblings we did not know we had, your new community of grace and truth and hope and love. Now in our praise, in our prayers, in our waiting, enter our lives again. Enter our lives with power for newness, with courage to one another, to love and cherish one another with hope and peace and joy that we may be your new creation in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let us continue in prayer as we share with God the confessions of our hearts. God, we are often busy. We get caught in the flow of a hectic pace and too quickly give up opportunities to be still and know you. God, forgive us when we become so busy we forget to pray. Forgive us when we are so enthralled by devices and gadgets that we forget to look up and take notice of all that is around us. We fail to notice our neighbors. We fail to Forgive us when we are so saturated by the news that we shut down completely, when we forget that we are called to be your servants, your witnesses here and now. Wake us up to the work of love at hand, and forgive us when we falter. Amen. Amen. The good news of the gospel is that we are loved, totally and unreservedly, and when we repent and ask for forgiveness, it is always there. Thanks be to God. Let us join in the singing of our next hymn, Jesus' Hands Are Kind Hands, found in Voices United 570.
Today is all about journeys. On a Sunday evening early in March, a few of us gathered here together to welcome Bree and Brooke as they began their journey of discernment that led to today. We talked about our own experiences of joining the church and what that, was, what that had meant for us. We gathered again on Good Friday to talk about this particular church and what it means to us and shared with the girls what the various committees and groups of St. John's do within these walls and out in the world. The girls and I have had other opportunities to talk about the wider United Church, what we are invited to believe in and what we stand for, bold discipleship, daring justice, and deep spirituality. We talked about worship, and Bree and Brooke helped craft our service for today. So I invite the girls to come and sit in the front pew, as well as their family and their mentors, Nancy Miller McKenzie and Debbie Banks, and Kathy Little, representing the congregation through her role as the chair of worship. Good morning. We're very, very proud parents this morning um, to be before you to introduce our daughters, who all of you present today and those of you who are joining us uh, from home online have seen our girls uh, grow up from when we first moved here when Bree turned 10 and then Brooke turned 9 shortly after we arrived from Alberta. There was a little gap in there where we didn't get to see each other, and I know that upon our return uh, to our sanctuary and our, our service and our time together for worship and then fellowship, the comments of how big they had grown and, and how they didn't look the way they last did that everybody saw them. As parents or people who are with them every day, we too, I think, sometimes can forget to see the changes that are taking place and that are reminded of when we then are those stories are shared with others of how, how they've grown or the questions of asking, what are they doing now? Or what grades are they in? And you tell them and then the look of surprise because time does not stand still. It moves along quickly as uh, we all witness and see that. And I think back about stories, what we're going to say or what would we share with you? Uh, and just the exposure and experiences that we as parents have been able to share with them and, and have with them, with their grandparents as well who are with us today, who have, I have to say, every place and those who have known us or heard our stories as far as where we lived in the high Arctic and very remote communities, uh, their grandparents, uh, Keith and Carol, who are with us today, have even come up to those every place that we have ever lived and spent many time with our girls. We FaceTime just about every day with them so that they don't get to miss out on those day-to-day -day things that we're so blessed to have and experience with them. So I just wanted to, in, in bringing back and thinking about things in our time with uh, our, our church family and everybody here, was that it was on October 8th in 2017, right after we moved here, where 
myself, as well as my girls, we were all baptized here. Um, and how that time has, has gone by. And that, again, was too shortly after we moved to Camp Bell where we decided that this was going to be our home and where we were going to put down roots because the girls themselves had had like four moves prior to that. And when I was thinking back how many airplanes that they had been on, it was like in like, I think, 30 airplanes or something. But by the time Brooke was three years old or two years old when we moved to Yellowknife, so just talking about movement and travel and going here and there, and it's just really nice to be settled in a place where we can make connections with everyone around us. Bree is getting ready to apply for university next year, and Brooke is, is never far behind her. She will follow the year after, as they're both going into grade 11 and 12 this coming fall. Earlier this week, April the 10th, was National Siblings Day, so it's fitting that this weekend we are getting, that they are getting confirmed together the same as they were baptized together, as I mentioned, in 2017. Our little girls are not so little anymore and are now young ladies getting ready for their next steps in life. Part of that is taking the next steps in their spiritual journey and making the decision to join the church themselves as members, along with their grandparents, who, as I mentioned, who are able to be with us here today. We would like to thank Reverend Bev Buckingham for helping them along that journey, along with as many other members of the, uh, our congregation who helped with their confirmation classes, as well as their mentors, Nancy and Debbie. Thank you again all so much. Thanks for that. Although I was hoping to hear, you know, some really embarrassing <laughs> stories. Boy. <laughs> Maybe we'll talk later. <laughs> but I do need to tell you that when I was talking with the, with the girls about, um, about their spiritual journeys, and they talked about how their parents had played a role in that, but they also talked about how their grandparents had played a role in that. And when I asked them if there was a special prayer that they prayed, they told me that Grammy had taught them their nighttime prayer and that that was a prayer that they still used every night. So thank you, Grandma and Grandpa, for the gifts that you have given to these girls. And Mom and Dad, to you as well. Now, I'm going to ask the girls to stand, please. We have some promises to make. Bree and Brooke, do you promise to live your life in such a way that others will see God's love in each of you? I do. God be with my children. Will you seek to continue the story of Jesus, following his example of how to treat ourselves and others? Will you try to make a difference in the world, helping others and treating all you meet with respect and care, open to where your future journey may call you? As you now add your voice to the congregation, to the voices of faith that make up the congregation of St. John's United Church, will you worship with them, work with them, and grow with them? Congregation, will you please rise as you are able? Will you welcome Bree and Brooke into your midst as equal partners in the life and work of St. John's United Church? And will you encourage them, support them, and celebrate with them as they begin this new portion of their faith journey? We will. God be our helper. <clears throat> Let us say together our new creed. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus like to just before we go on explain a little bit about the promises that the girls made these were promises that a group of young people that I worked with a few years ago wrote as they talked about what it meant for them as young people to be part of the church today and when the girls and I talked 
they agreed that these were promises that they could make, that they could keep, and that were in language that was theirs. And so the promises are important to them because they thought them through, they prayed about them, and they offered them to you. So each of our young people will be called to come and kneel with their family and their mentors, Nancy Miller McKenzie and Debbie Banks, and the chair of the worship committee, Kathy Little. They will be blessed, and we will all lay our hands on them to indicate our love and support. They will be gifted with a Bible with their certificate of confirmation tucked inside, but the best gift comes from you, the congregation, as you promise to support and encourage them and walk the journey of faith with them. And the girls wanted to face you when they, when they did this. Family, please. I bless you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Welcome into full membership in St. John's United Church, knowing that you are a much-loved child of God. And this is where the, the hugs, the handshakes, and the presentation comes in. <laughs> and the tears. There are always tears. I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Welcome into full membership in the congregation of St. John's United Church, knowing that you are a much-loved child. Welcome to you both. And congregation, you are very lucky to have these young people in your midst, and they have great plans for you. We talked about a project. <laughs> we talked about a project, and I think they're going to invite you all to take part in that, so be on the lookout for what they have planned for you. They are going places, and you're going with them. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, choir. Well, we're going to get to sing too. So please join us for the singing of our next hymn found in Voices United 583, Jesus Came a Child Like Me.
Our first reading this morning is from 1 John, chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. And I'm reading from the message. What marvelous love the Father has extended to us. Just look at it. We're called children of God, those who we really are. But that's also why the world doesn't recognize us or take us seriously, because it has no idea who he is or what he's up to. But friends, that's exactly who we are, children of God. And that's only the beginning. Who knows how we'll end up? What we know is that when Christ is openly revealed, we'll see him. And in seeing him, become like him. All of us who look forward to his coming stay ready with the glistening purity of Jesus' life as a model for our own. All who indulge in a sinful life are dangerously lawless, for sin is a major disruption of God's order. Surely you know that Christ showed up in order to get rid of sin. There is no sin in him, and sin is not part of his program. No one who lives deeply in Christ makes a practice of sin. None of those who do practice sin have taken a good look at Christ. They've got him all backwards. So my children, don't let anyone divert you from the truth. It's the person who acts right, who is right, just as we see it lived out in our righteous Messiah. And our responsive psalm is number four, I believe, found on page 727, and it's also up on the screen. The choir will lead us. Answer me when I call, O God, defender of my cause, for you set me free when I was in distress. Be gracious to me now and hear my prayer. How long, you people, will you defame my honor? How long will you love what is worthless and seek lies? Know this, that God has chosen the faithful. God hears me when I fall. Stand in awe and cease from sin. Commune with your own heart on, on your bed and be still. Offer the sacrifices that are appointed. And then put your trust in God. There are many who say, Oh, that we might see prosperity. Lift up the light of your face on us, O God. But you have put gladness in my heart more than those whose grain and wine are plentiful. Safe and sound, I lie down and sleep. For you alone, O God, make me well in safety. reading from Luke chapter 24, four, sorry, verses 13 to 35, the road to Emmaus. That same day, two of them were walking to the village Emmaus, about seven miles out of Jerusalem. They were deep in conversation, going over all these things that had happened. In the middle of their talk and questions, Jesus came up and walked along with them, but they were not able to recognize who he was. He asked, what's this you're discussing so intently as you walk along? They just stood there long-faced, like they had lost their best friend. Then one of them, his name was Cleopas, said, are you the only one in Jerusalem who hasn't heard what happened during the past few days? 
And he said, what has happened? And they said, the things that happened to Jesus, the Nazarene, he was a man of God, a prophet, dynamic in work and word, blessed by both God and all the people. Then our high priests and leaders betrayed him, got him sentenced to death, and crucified him. And we had our hopes up that he was the one, the one about to deliver Israel. And it is now the third day since it happened, but now some of our women have completely confused us. Early this morning, they were at the tomb and couldn't find his body. They came back with the story that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of our friends went off to the tomb to check and found it empty, just as the women said, but they didn't see Jesus. Then he said to them, so thick-headed, so slow-hearted, why can't you simply believe all that the prophet said? Don't you see that these things had to happen, that the Messiah had to suffer and only then enter into his glory? Then he started at the beginning with the books of Moses and went on through all the prophets, pointing out everything in the scriptures that referred to him. They came to the edge of the village where they were headed. He acted as if they were going on, he acted as if he was going on, but they pressed him, stay and have supper with us. It's nearly evening, the day is done. So he went with them, and here is what happened. He sat down at the table with them. Taking the bread, he blessed and broke and gave it to them. At that moment, open-eyed, wide-eyed, they recognized him, and then he disappeared. Back and forth they talked. Didn't we feel on fire as he conversed with us on the road, as he opened up the scriptures for us? They didn't waste a minute. They were up and on their way back to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and their friends gathered together, talking away. It's really happened. The master has been raised up. Simon saw him. Then the two went over everything that happened on the road and how they recognized him when he broke the bread.
Wasn't that absolutely beautiful? <clears throat> when I was 15, I stood at the front of this church, as Bree and Brooke did today, and was confirmed with four other members. And I, too, was confirmed with somebody who I was baptized with. It was a special day for me. But it was the time leading up to that that was the most special. And I remember sitting in the minister's office. Bob Percival was the minister at that point in time, and Rick was part of the confirmation class. Was always being told to sit up straight. But that's an aside. And I remember vividly some of those conversations that we had in that room. And one of the things that has stuck with me all of these years was that Bob said at that point in time that the Bible was filled with wonderful stories. And I thought, stories? I love stories. I love hearing about people. This must be an interesting book. He said, in the Bible, there are stories of people who are like you and like me. And there will be many times in your life when different things happen and you'll need to find some place to go to find somebody else who has experienced the same thing. And he told us to go to the Bible because that's where we would find people who were like us, who had a relationship with God, sometimes good, sometimes trying, sometimes not recognizing that it was there. And we would find our strength in that place. I have remembered that, that all these years, and I have told every single confirmation class I have ever taught that story because it made a deep impression. And as I listened to the story this morning, I thought, yeah, I could, I could place myself in that story. I could have been one of those people on the road to Emmaus and not recognize Jesus in my confusion, in my sadness in my inability to think about anybody else but myself in that moment. So thank you, Bob Percival, for my confirmation and for my introduction into this wonderful congregation. My reflection this morning is entitled On the Road Again. There they were, just the two of them, trudging down the dusty road out of Jerusalem, heading to Emmaus, heartbroken and beaten down with loss and despair. Their conversation was all about what had just happened in the city, and they couldn't quite seem to wrap their minds around it at all. For Cleopas and his companion, the week leading up to that fateful day had been about conquest and celebration, and, and, then, and then he was gone. Jesus had been crucified, and all that they had hoped for seemed to be gone with him. The women who went to prepare his body for burial told of how they had found the tomb empty and then saw angels who told them that he was alive. Now, as they walked along the road, they talked back and forth, going over it all again and again, and they were so confused. As they walked, heads down and somber, they barely noticed the man who joined them until he spoke. He asked them what it was that they were talking about, and they turned to him in great surprise. Where have you been, they asked. Are you the only one who hasn't heard what has happened these last few days? So it all came tumbling out, and they told the newcomer what they knew. Now they thought he must be a scholar of some sort because he berated them and asked them why they were having such a hard time believing what had happened. Did they not know their scripture? Did they not know that these things had to happen? That the Messiah had to suffer before he could enter into his glory? By now, they were at the gates to the village, and the newcomer starts to head away. But Cleopas asks him to stay and join them for supper. They enter a house together, and as they sit down to this shared meal, the guest takes bread and breaks it and gives it to them. And they know. They recognize in this everyday simple gesture that it is Jesus in their midst. And as he disappears from them, they are once more filled with hope for what is to come. Jesus is alive. He is risen. John Dominic Crossan wrote this about the Luke passage. He said, Emmaus never happened. Emmaus always happens. 
he invites us to grapple with the truth that the factual significance of the resurrection stories is secondary to the more profound truth. The risen Christ is with us now, here. That is what the early church began to learn and what enabled them to move on. It is what we must remember today to enable us to move forward as well, to enable us to be on the road again. Sometimes I think we become so preoccupied with our own concerns or grief that we don't stop and realize that God is amongst us. God comes to us disguised as our life, writer Paula Darcy says. God is always there on the journey. We, sp we may spend years failing or refusing to recognize God, believing we are on the road of our own choosing. We can be blind to or ig ignore the signposts, yet when we look back, we see, like the disciples on the road to Emmaus, there is a God presence all along our roadway. So, let's talk about roads and journeys in scripture story for a moment. A journey brings Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem. A road is the narrative setting for the parable of the Good Samaritan. A road leads the prodigal back to his father. Jesus travels to Jerusalem on a road filled with believers cheering and shouting Hosanna. And now these followers are traveling away from the sadness and uncertainty that the results of that journey brought to them. <clears throat> the journey continues into Acts, where Paul encounters the risen Christ on his way to Damascus. All of this travel was moving towards something, then moving on to something else. Our faith calls us to travel as well. And roads and walkways become a symbol of a faith on the move. As a Nister people, we are called to be on the road again and again. One of our former moderators, Peter Short, wrote about this resurrection journey in his book, Outside Eden. He writes that the weary noun resurrection should be seen as a verb, one that he calls rising thereby making it not something that happened long, long ago, but something that still happens again and again today. In our story, the rising does not come immediately to our two followers, but instead it comes in the breaking of bread and the sharing of hospitality. Who knows, he goes on to say, when we might find ourselves in an upstairs room, doors locked in fear, when across the room we see a stranger, uninvited, alive, impossible, and yet there he is and life is on again. We have been raised to life by Christ. Later on in Acts, Paul will say just that, we have been raised. He didn't say you, you will be raised someday when it's time to go to heaven. He speaks of our life now. He doesn't say you'll be raised if you are good or lucky. Here and now, we have been raised to life in Christ. But sometimes we forget. Sometimes we don't even realize that the rising is happening in and for us. Like Jesus on the road to Emmaus, God must shake his head in disbelief as we don't seem to recognize the Christ rising beside us. Short goes on to say, God has clearly and powerfully opened doors for us, and yet we still head directly for the same old prisons, the old familiar tombs, ignoring the fearful life of Easter to crawl into the safer gloom behind the stone. We choose this because this is the life we know. We've grown accustomed to its face. It's not a surprise, after all, that the first emotion of the rising is fear. Fear of living. Fear of living without a net. Fear of life in a different world.
God's world, where even the stones cry out. Here is where we remember that fear for the two travelers on the road to Emmaus turns to hope in the breaking of the bread, in the recognition of the rising, in the hospitality of Jesus. Jesus hadn't revealed himself right away. He had waited. He'd walked with them, and he'd listened to them. He journeyed with them where they were, heartbroken, weary, downtrodden, and he was just there, present, as they told of their disappointment and confusion and grief. So, here we are on our own roads, not always of our choosing, sometimes feeling a little lost and lonely, discouraged and confused and grieving losses along the way. But the rising is with us. The risen Christ is in our midst, maybe as of yet unrecognized in the moment, but there nonetheless allowing us to lament and tell our story of loss and sadness. The risen Christ is here, and we are invited to recognize and welcome him. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our offering is how we share a portion from our abundance, our time, our energy, our resources, our way of giving with gratitude, giving thanks to God who is steadfast in love. Let us give our morning offering. pray. Creator God, help us reach out to others using these gifts as we strive to be an Easter people to the community we serve. May we use all that is given to further your work in the world, to plant and to nurture and to sprout seeds of justice and inclusion for all. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us continue in prayer as we offer our pastoral prayers. Creator God, being a Christian is risky business. You ask us to follow your lead, and sometimes we find ourselves standing on the edge, afraid that we are going to fall over. But through Jesus, you've been there before us. You have stood on the edge for what you believed and what you proclaimed. There is nothing that we are asked to bear or endure that you do not understand. You cannot promise us that everything will turn out the way we want it to, but you do promise us that you will stand with us at all the precipices of our lives, as well as those times when we think we are on stable ground and have all the answers. But maybe we don't. Yes, being a Christian is risky business. And we thank you for being on this journey with us and for leading and guiding us along the way. Holy One, we offer prayers for all those in need or want, those who are sick or sad or lonely, those in power who need to stop and take a breath, and those who are, are oppressed and in harm's way. We pray for our families and our friends for all that we are blessed with and too often take for granted. Help us to recognize the Jesus that walks this journey with us as we ask these things in the name of the one who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You know, Bob Percival pops up into my mind again every time I say this prayer, because he came to our school when I was in grade 8 as part of the ministers visiting schools. That shows how old I am, because that was a very long time ago. And he talked about the Lord's Prayer. And he talked about how we memorize it and then we rhyme it off and it's done. And he encouraged us to do it line by line and to think about all the things that we were saying as we prayed that prayer. And I have never prayed it again in the same way. And I was in grade eight when he told me that. So he did make a, a major influence in my life. I also sang in the choir when I was here. Not well, but I sang in the choir. <laughs> in the junior choir with, June, with Jean Newens at that point in time. And I love to sing, so let's sing again the, the <laughs> hymn, I'm Going to Live So God Can Use Me, Voices Unite at 575. <laughs> Some serve for a moment. Some serve for what it feels like forever. Yet together we all serve with God's help. We share in the promise of new life that begins with celebrating something wonderful. We are loved by God and we are all being sent out by God to love one another as, as God loves us. This is our call and our mission. Thanks be to God. Thank you for that. 